Good morning, everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about Job, uh, and I'm going to focus on the chapters 26 to 31. I recently stumbled upon these chapters and, and was delighted by things that I read in it. Um, for the past couple of years, I've been kind of following the Daily Truth Base for, for my quiet times, and um, that skips these chapters, so I hadn't read them in a while. And then one day my internet wasn't working, and so I had to use uh, a paper Bible to to read and for my quiet time. And I just happened to land on these chapters, and I thought, wow, these are really awesome. So I just had a strong desire to kind of go through them and share some of the nuggets that I uh, discovered with you all. So the book of Job is the oldest book of the Bible, so they are truly ancient words, like I was just saying. Um, and the main point of the book seems to be that... Um, not all suffering that happens in the world is because of um, like a direct, direct consequence of someone's sin. Uh, sometimes bad things happen to good people. Um, but you could also argue that a more important part of the book is to show that God is really God and we are not. God is in control and we really should just trust that God will work things out um, for his best if we try to be pleasing to him um, and also then for our best. So. Because as soon as God really starts talking at the end, it's really about showing that he's God and, and we're not. So, But the majority of the book is about Job discussing with his friends about, hey, why, is, why are all these bad things happening to me? So the book starts with a description of Job's life before. Um, he was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen and 500 donkeys. <laughs> he had a large number of servants and was considered the greatest man <coughs> in the East. So he was very, very much blessed. And like you know, description says that he was a righteous man. He was upright and blameless. He even burned offerings regularly for his, uh, in the case that his children had sinned, and to kind of, um, uh, that's why he burnt the sacrifices so that God would look over that. And then we get a highly unusual scene in the Bible. Angels and Satan appear before God. So God talks directly with Satan. He asked him where he came from. Satan replies that he was on the earth um, and just spending time there. And next thing that God does is he starts bragging about Job. Like, Have you seen my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. It's pretty impressive to uh, have God brag about you <laughs> to, to Satan. Um, we know from the New Testament and uh, Paul's letter to Ephesians that kind of purpose for uh, us being here and, and for Christ coming is to show to Satan that he actually could have obeyed. And this seems to be kind of a direct reference to that as well. Like, hey, have you seen my... my he's actually doing what, what he should have been, what you should have been doing. So... Um, Satan then challenges God. He says that Job only does this because of all the blessings that he's received from God. But if you take away the blessings, then he would, he would not be so upright anymore and he would curse God to his faith, face. So God accepts the challenge and allows Satan to have his way with Job. And one day, the next things happen to Job. His oxen and his donkeys get stolen by bandits who also kill all the servants who were with those animals. His sheep and the servants tending them were burnt with fire from above. And then his camels, they were stolen by a group of bandits who also killed the servants who were tending them. And then his ten children who were in one house all died because the house crashed on them. All of this in one day. Uh, well, we recently got one child, and I cannot imagine how I would feel if he would be taken away all of a sudden. And, and to have, have happened is to ten of your children in one go. It's pretty tough. Um, so what does Job do? Does he... Um... We'll continue. So Job just lost everything in one day. And what is his response? He tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. That's an incredible response. Um, he recognized that God, God's hand was in it, that God allowed it, that God gives and that God takes away. 
and he decided to teach, to bless God's name in both good times and bad times. That is what righteous people do. Their view of God and their relationship with God does not depend on the external circumstances and it does not depend on the things that God gives and that God takes away. It depends on the person and character of God. The story continues. The ancients and Satan present themselves again before God. The conversation this time is pretty much a rehearsal of the last time. Um, and Satan again challenges God. He says, yeah, well, okay, he's still, you know, still obedient, but that's only because he still have, has his health. If you take that away, he will curse you in your face. Um, so God allows Satan to take Job's health. Satan goes and afflicts Job with painful sores all over his body. It gets so bad that he scrapes his own skin with a piece of broken pottery. Um, pretty miserable situation. And at that stage, Job's wife comes and speaks to him. And she says, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So, just a phenomenal response to very challenging situations. So, from this point on, Satan does no longer come back into the whole story. And Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Sofar, they arrive on the scene. They heard about Job's hardships and they agreed together to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. So they tore their clothes, they sat together with Job in silence for seven days. Um, but, but what do you do in such a situation when a friend like has so much hardship going on? Um, they, they just sit and are silent with him for seven days. Uh, what do you say? Um, I, I would not know immediately what to say, but um, neither did they, and they just sat there, show their sympathy to Job by being there and um, try to comfort him by just mourning together with him. Um, then the conversation starts. Job speaks out first, then his friends respond, and then Job responds, and then they respond, and Job responds. And this goes on for many chapters until we get to the chapters that we're going to about talk about today, 26 to 31. This part is Job's longest discourse, and after he speaks this part, his friends no longer have anything to say. They are silent. Um, only a new, younger guy, Elihu, comes up to the scene, and he also speaks many chapters, like 20, 32 to 37, but Job does not even respond to him. So uh, I've always kind of wondered like, what those chapters really add to the story, but uh, I did find the chapters that Job spoke very, very revealing. So we'll go through them in a bit more detail today and see what we can learn from them. The main point that Job's friends tried to make can be summarized in what uh, Bill Dead wrote in 25, chapter 25. He says, How then can a man be righteous before God, or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? If even the sun does not shine and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is a maggot and son of a man who is a worm. So, their main point is that a man cannot be righteous, um, that therefore Job must have sinned, and that therefore the bad things that happened to him were a consequence of his sin. Um, I guess this is where we get the word warm theology from, because these people just literally say, like, man is a son of man who is a worm. Um, if you compare us human beings who are finite with an infinite God, then yes, infinite compares to something finite. It's like we're infinitely, infinitely small compared to God who created us. But he did create us in his image, and he gave us the, the task to rule over all his other creatures. So if you then say that we are equal to a worm, then that's not accurate either. So Job does answer their point, but not immediately. First in... Um, 26, he responds to his friend and he says, How have you helped him who is without power? How have you saved the arm that has no strength? How have you counseled one who has no wisdom? And how have you declared sound advice to many? To whom have you uttered words and whose spirit came from you? Um, so Job responds with a pretty heavy dose of sarcasm to his friend, like, Hey man, what, what have you really done to, to help people? And did people do people really listen to your advice? And Job was in a position to 
say this because he was known to give really good counsel and people did listen to his advice when he spoke. In 29, 21, he says, men listened to me and waited and kept silent for my counsel. And there's more verses that show that Job's counsel was highly regarded. But Job himself was not impressed with the counsel of his friend and he will go on to rebuke it. Um, then the next thing in this chapter is Job starts talking about God. Um, verses 5 to 14 share a lot of details about God's creation of the earth and shows how uh, mighty and powerful God is. Um, sums it up in verse 14. Indeed, these are the mere edges of his ways. And how small a whisper we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? So Job, Job shows that God is far above us and that many of the things that God is doing um, are, we, we do not understand or we do not know because our perspective is so limited and finite compared to God's infinite um, perspective and strength and wisdom. And then Job starts talking about himself, responding basically directly to the words of, uh, of his friends. He first mentions that God has denied him justice and made him suffer, but then that he will not speak evil and he does maintain his integrity. He says, far be it from me that I should say, you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Um, Job is not admitting that he is a sinner. He will not admit that he is a sinner because he wasn't. Uh, Job is a righteous man. Just remember, God even himself said so, um, that he's upright and blameless. So these words, though, sound pretty prideful. When somebody would say to you, like, I, my heart shall not reproach me as long as I live, my righteousness I hold fast and I will not let go, that sounds prideful, but it's also, in Job's case, an accurate reflection of, of the situation. Um, in general, people will not appreciate it if you say things like this about yourself. Um, in Job's case, it was true. And his words were a response to the attacks of his friends, so they were warranted. He then explains that the wicked do actually indeed get punished by God. He said, this is the portion of a wicked man, 20, uh, chapter 27, verse 13, the portion of a wicked man with God, and the heritage of oppressors received from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword, and his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread. Those who survive him shall be buried in death, and their widows shall not weep. Though he heaps up silver like dust and piles up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the just will wear it, and the innocent will divide the silver. Um, the rich man will lie down, but not be gathered up. He opens his eyes, and he is no more. The east wind carries him away, and he is gone. It kind of sounds like what happened to Job in his description, like his children are not there, and all the stuff that he had is, is, is gone. So, um, so you could ask, like, hey, Job, are you not, not kind of in, um, discriminating yourself indirectly by saying that this is the things that happened to the wicked because it happened to you? Um, are you therefore not wicked? But you'll, um, we'll, we'll come back to that. Because the next chapter, all of a sudden, seems a little bit weird and out of context. Um, chapter 28, and I really encourage you to, to take your time one day and just go through it. It's pretty awesome. Because it starts with um, 11 verses long describing how we get precious metals from the earth. Um, there's a lot of, and this is the oldest book of the Bible, and yet there's a lot of detail about iron ore, uh, copper ore, silver ore, gold, um, sapphires, how they're all taken from the earth, how men dig tunnels, etc. It's a lot of like, emphasis on how do we get precious metals and precious stones out of the earth. The Proverbs talk about this as well, but here there's way more detail, so it's pretty impressive. But um, after this kind of mining 101 course, Job talks about wisdom. He just shifts topic. Okay. What does he say? We know now how precious metals and stones get found, but how do we get wisdom? He says we cannot dig for it in mountains, we cannot buy it with gold, and it cannot be exchanged for jewelry. And he says it is hidden, but God knows where and how to get it. So. 28 verse 12 says, But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. From where then does wisdom come? 
And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. God understands its ways and he knows its place. For he looks to the end of the earth and sees under the whole heavens. Then he saw wisdom and declared it. He prepared it indeed. He searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. So, um, people who read the Proverbs regularly know indeed that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, the book of Job and the Proverbs are compatible with each other. And it's interesting that these exactly two things that are said about wisdom and understanding fear of the Lord and depart from evil, is how God described Job in the beginning of this whole book. He says Job is a righteous and upright man who fears the Lord and shuns evil. So these are really important concepts. So after this discourse on mining and then wisdom, Job starts uh, thinking back of the good old days. Life was very good for him. God blessed his house. He mentioned that he was honored by young and old rich and poor, princes and noblemen, and then he actually gives a reason that life was so good. In 29 verse 12, he, he gives the reason in the next verses. The reason that life was so good is because he rescued the poor who cried out to help. Um, he was there to help those who were fatherless and those who had nobody to help them. He caused widows' hearts to sing for joy. He put on righteousness and justice. He was eyes to the blind. He was feet to the lame. He was a father to the poor, he searched out cases that were hard to understand, and he broke the fangs of the wicked and rescued victims from them. So he's giving a list of things that he was doing which made him an upright man, and as a result, God blessed him, and others honored him. But now, and then we're now in chapter 30, he describes that people mock him. Um, men much younger than himself make fun of him. Filed people taunt him, and people spit in his face. Why is this? In verse 11 he says, because God has afflicted him. And because other people see that God has afflicted him, they also rise up against him. As a result, his soul is poured out, and his bones pierce him in the night. Um, because in chapter 30 we, we see um, his response to that, he cries out to God. Chapter 30, verses 20, he says, I cry out to you, but you do not answer me. I stand up, and you regard me, but you have become cruel to me. With the strength of your hand, you oppose me. So Job thinks that God has done all these bad things to him, which is not true. Satan did it, but God did allow it. Job continues, he said, Have I not wept for him who was in trouble? Has not my soul grieved for the poor? But when I looked for good, evil came to me. And when I waited for light, then came darkness. So basically Job says it, it just does not make sense. I did what was right. I expected good to happen to me. But instead, evil came. Um, and he's crying out to God. So just in case someone still doubts whether Job was a good man, yes or no, um, he recounts his good deeds in chapter 31. And I kind of call this chapter the portrait of a righteous man because... When you go through it, you see just many character traits that a good person, um, this, in this case Job, is doing. So I think there are many lessons for us in it. If we want to be righteous people, then we can kind of learn from it what it means to be uh, a good, good man in the eyes of God. Very quick summary, and I'll go into each of the items in a little bit more detail. Um, Job did not look with lust at girls. He controlled his eyes. He did not lie. He did not let his desires be led by the things that he saw. He did not let his heart be enticed by somebody other than his wife. He did justice. He helped the poor. He helped the widow and the fatherless. He did not trust in riches. He did not rejoice at the misfortune of people who hated him. He was hospitable to strangers. And he did not hide his sins. He was transparent about when he messed up. And he was fair in his business dealings. So that's a really good kind of summary of like what it means to be a, a good person. So. Let's go through it. Chapter one, uh, thir chapter 31, verse 1, he says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Verse 4, he says, Does not he see my ways and count all my steps? Now, God sees all that we do, and this realization helped Job to overcome what is probably one of the hardest things for us guys. 
Guys may say, oh, just a little glance, what hurt does that do? But Jesus said that if we look at a woman to lust for them, we already committed adultery in our hearts. So Job knew this principle and he made a covenant with his eyes not to do this. Um, in 5 we read, If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. But Job did not lie, you could trust him for his word. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart walked after my eyes, or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat. Yes, let my harvest be rooted out. So, um, this little phrase, my heart walked after my eyes. Um, you know, our heart is where our desires and, and um, values really reside. They did not follow after the things that he saw. Um, so he didn't immediately desire the things that he see. Then he says, if my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another, and let others bow down over her. But that would be wickedness. Um, yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment. For that would be a fire that consumes to destruction, and would root out all my increase. So, the thing that would root out all his increase, and that would be deserving of judgment, is if his heart would have been enticed by uh, another woman. So, he's, uh, he's a faithful one wife, husband. Then he says, if I have despised the cause of my male or female servant when they complained against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? This is really interesting that um, when his servants came to him and complained against him, um, he did not despise their cause. He actually listened to them and tried to um, like he mentioned before, he tried to understand the, um, the situation and be, uh, be righteous and, and have a just response to what they brought up. Because otherwise um, he would have no answer to, uh, to God. Then he says, if I have kept the door from their desire or caused the eyes of the widow to fill or eaten my morsel by myself so that the fatherless, fatherless could not eat of it, if I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or any poor man without covering, if his heart had not blessed me, and if he was not warned with the fleece of my sheep, if I raised my hand against the fatherless when I saw I had help in the gate, then let my arm fall from my shoulder, and let my arm be torn from the socket. For destruction from God is a terror to me, and because of his magnificence I cannot endure. So in these verses he shows that uh, the people that had less power and less um, resources in society, he was really there to help them. The fatherless, so the widows and the people who had no money, he was there to help them. And that's a, that's a really good Christian thing to do. Um, and then in 24 to 26, some verses that probably um, hit home to a lot of Christians who live in wealthy places, especially like here in New York City, said, if I have made my gold, if I have made gold my hope, or said to find gold, you are my confidence. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great, and because my head, hand had gained too much, if I have observed the sun when it shines, or the moon moving in brightness, so that my heart has been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity, deserving of judgment, for I would have denied God who is above. Um, I must say this verse 25 was kind of um, hitting home because you know we we here in New York we, we make good money and we want to be good stewards of that and so we invest it in the stock market and then when it goes up I tend to get happy as a result and uh, here it says I have if I have rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gained much okay um, clearly we do not want to put our worth and value and a joy in something as temporal as uh, earthly treasures. Uh, we want to put our joy and uh, confidence in God and our relationship with Him. And then in 29 he says, If I have rejoiced at the destruction of Him who hated me, or lifted myself up when evil found Him, indeed I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. So. Job, like you know, most righteous people and most uh, blessed people, they have enemies and there's people who hated him. 
but he did not ask a curse on their soul because that would make his mouth to sin. It's also a really interesting verse to me meditate on. Um, if the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been satisfied with his meat? But no sojourner had to lodge in the street, for I have opened my doors to the traveler. So, um, being hospital, hospitable to strangers and opening your house for people who need it, it's a, it's a good thing to do. It's what righteous people do. And then finally he says, if I have covered my transgression as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, because I feared the great multitude and dreaded the contempt of families, so that I kept silent and did not go out of the door. Um, so again, these are things that you should not do. So um, to hide your transgressions, if if you missed messed up and you made a mistake or there was sin, um, hiding your iniquity is not a good thing. Instead, you want to be transparent about it, confess and. Don't do it again. And the reason he says that why you might be tempted to hide your transgressions is because you feared the multitude or uh, dreaded the contempt of families. So it's really a fear of man that you're ashamed of how other people kind of see you. And as a result, you might be tempted to um, hide less uh, pleasant parts of yourself. But Job did not do that. So. Job was truly a righteous man, and yet horrible disaster happened to him. And then in the end, he kind of challenges God to answer him. He says, oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. And NIV says, here is my defense. That the Almighty would answer me that my uh, prosecutor had written a book. So he kind of challenges God, like, okay, this is my case. I don't deserve this. Now what's up? And God does answer indeed. Um, chapters 38 and 39, God speaks and shows Job all that he has done and his power. He just explains, like, I am God, I've created everything, I'm, I'm in control of the situation, and it's pretty overwhelming. And Job does get the message, because in 40 we read, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile, what shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. And then in the rest of chapter 40 and 41, God still continues more to show his might and show that he is God and Job's not. So in chapter 42, Job says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. So, Job, you know, throws in the towel, said, okay, God, you're God, I'm not. Um, I, I spoke of things that are actually uh, beyond my knowledge, and uh, you know everything, I can trust you. So, then God kind of gives a review about everything that has happened, and um, spoke, speaks to Job's friends. He says, my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. <coughs> and so Job has to go and make a sacrifice for his friends, and God accepts that. And then the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys, and he also had seven sons and three daughters. Um, and after all this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. And God never explained what happened. Why did this happen? God never said, well, we had this bad going on. Uh -huh. So Job just had to trust God that God knows what he's doing. And um, maintain his righteousness, maintain doing what is right. So um, I think there's a lot of good lessons in this part of scripture. I think the list of uh, character traits for a righteous man are very applicable to all of us today, so I would encourage you to go and do likewise and be blessed by God in the end as a result. Any questions or thoughts? So what did exactly Joseph's friends uh, do wrong? <coughs> like, what, did, what did exactly the three friends did that 
So they did not speak the right of uh, God the way Job had. So um, they continued to say to Job, you have sinned, as a result this is happening to you. But if they had looked at Job's life and looked at like the things that he did, they could have seen it. Well, this is a righteous man. He is, there's, there's no sin in his life that has caused all of this. So um, to accuse righteous people of sin is uh, not a good thing in God's eyes. Can you touch on, it's, it, I just never caught the fact that he said about himself that he did not hide his sins. So clearly he did sin at some point and he was not perfect. So just that difference between being righteous and blameless and still having sin at some point is like... Yeah, I don't think that um, blameless and upright means that you never ever miss the mark. That you do always everything that's 100% right. I don't think it means like flawless perfection. Um, I do think it means when you mess up, when you make a mistake, you do correct it in the right way. And it's not like a, a, a habit, it's not something you often do. And when you do it and people do point out to you that, like, hey, I don't think this was really right, then you're humbled and you say, oh, wow, I didn't realize that. I'm sorry, let me not do that again. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, in the oh, the not rejoicing at the misfortune of those who hated him. You said he did not ask for a curse on their soul. How would you compare that to some of David's psalms when it seems like he almost is asking for a curse on his enemies or asking God to punish them severely? There's some pretty brutal language that point. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer. Also, in the New Testament, we know that Paul sometimes uh, prayed um, that bad things would happen to God's people who were sinning, yeah. um, clearly for the purpose of their restoration, that they would realize, like, wow, life is not working, um, maybe I should do things differently in order to get God's blessings again. Um, so maybe it's the motivation that's behind it. Um, I also think that... Um, Job was probably a more righteous man than David in many ways. Yeah. So. I think also there's a difference between praying for them to be taken down and gloating while they're on their way down. Yeah, I definitely mentioned that he's not rejoicing over um, their misfortunes, but he does say, like, I'm not praying verses over them. So this question, so practically in our life, so when I think maybe four hours that if I obey, I will ask to keep us sometimes, it doesn't happen, right? And what do you think is key to not doubt God's goodness when things, you know, doesn't happen? Like, I haven't done anything wrong, but then what is it? It's mm-hmm. oh. a good question. Um, I think it, 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 it all starts with trusting God. Yeah, okay, he is the infinite creator. I have to trust that he is good, that he keeps his promises, that in the end he will bless uh, the righteous behavior. Um, God never promised that everything in life will be smooth sailing. In fact, he promised the, the, the opposite of that if you really follow him. So um, he also promised that this life is temporal and next life is eternal. And eternal is way longer than temporal. And so. Um, I think the right kind of response to when bad things happen to you in this life is to say, okay, well, God, remember, and please make it up for me, and look at my response, I'm, I'm responding in the right way. Sometimes I think it's also our perspective of what's good. Mm-hmm. You might think that, okay, yes, it is, this is a bad thing, but that's our human temporal perspective. But actually, if it's like something that's bad, that actually helps us to Tribulation, perseverance, character, hope. You extract one of those. You know, they're there for a reason. It's in that order. So, tribulation does 
obviously within that development character, the farmer and land, and then that's a workable. So I would spend time kind of thinking about that progression, you know. Um, but it comes out of, at least in moments, through those. And also, like, if everything's so good, then how can you show your trust in God, right? I mean, yeah. something has to come to show that you really trust in God. Yeah, I think also in Job's case, um, there's probably gigantic eternal rewards for the way that he responded to the whole situation. That he did not bless, uh, did not curse God, and God blessed him instead. Uh, uh, just to tag on to that, he actually he had lots of him when God was blessing him too, because he had maintained righteousness even though he was wealthy. Uh, yeah, even though he was what? Wealthy. Questions, thoughts? It's sad that we have two white balls at both. I know. We have the three friends. This is, you, you know, he held, he, he held on to the droop. Is this my son? No. No, because he gets the same way. If he read she would have been truly grateful for him. He did get uh, ten more children, so I guess they reconciled. <laughs> yeah, they became And in every verse he tied back to fear God because he knows that even though his sin, even no one could know, he knows that God loves. <clears throat> I think for us, it just have to remember even though no one sees what we're doing, God sees. There's a fear of God that we said is tied together. Very, very good point. Yes, absolutely. Closing prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the example of Job, who responded in a phenomenal way when life just crashed down on him. Father, we pray that you would protect us from similar catastrophes this week. We pray that if bad things or challenging things happen, tribulations, that we would have the correct response. So, Father, help us to prepare for uh, challenging situations and help us to respond in a way that is pleasing to you so that. You get glorified as a result, and we get rewarded in the end. Father, we pray this uh, in your son's name.